Well, everyone, welcome back to the Roundup. Today's first story from Casey Hudson, who, uh, well, very long stint at Bioware. Then he left, then he came back as general manager, and then he went. But it was kind of weird because Casey left Bioware really right when it had seemed like the, you know, the the good things were, I mean, not literally coming out of them in terms of games, but, you know, they were making some good statements, right, about Dragon Age 4 and New Mass Effect, stuff like that. Then Casey leaves. Has a lot of people scratching their heads. But now, the uh, not particularly surprising has happened, to be honest, where Casey has um, said that he's been working with some colleagues and something awesome, which is he, you know, he could tell us about it, can't, but that he can say that they are, uh, well, a new video game company. Yes, he's founded a studio that is built to unleash the creative freedom of developers, bringing innovation and artistry to players through all new IP. The studio is called Humanoid, which is rather funny. I mean, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you're, you're almost tempted to read in a little bit to, um, to how a lot of these X AAA sort of companies end up positioning themselves with, uh, you know, their values and all of that. But no, it just says Humanoid Studios, founded by Casey Hudson and devs all over the world, combining arts and sciences and interactive entertainment. We don't really know that much. They're hiring a bunch of senior roles, and that is essentially that. There's really not that much else to say here. It's not that surprising. Yeah, there's only one thing to maybe read into a little bit which is the statement here versus, you know, considering where he left Bioware after, after Anthem went so wrong, after what happened to Andromeda and stuff, then going, we believe in hiring great people, empowering them with the best tools and a supportive environment and providing them the creative freedom to do their best work. Frostbite. <laughs> Frostbite, also EA Creative Control that killed Dead Space 3, etc., etc. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a mirror of what happened with, you know, Dreamhaven and Frost Giant and uh, David Kim's new studio and stuff like that, where they are all, like, it does seem like they all just left and went, no, we don't like how things are going. We'll go do the old thing, but new. Yeah. And, I mean, like, you're talking about Humanoid Studios. Every, like, I'm not a big Mass Effect guy, but I just see Humanoid and I immediately think, oh, that, why does that sound like Mass Effect to me? Why does that immediately, <laughs> that connection's immediately drawn in my head? Well, it's, it's just funny. I mean, even if you think about Mass Effect, Mass Effect 3 was crunched out in an absurdly tiny amount of time, which explains loads of Mass Effect 3's problems. And like, you know, that was the the end of the, the big thing that he started. And yes, the controversial ending was because he basically locked himself in a, in a room for a weekend and did the ending. And I mean, I didn't like the ending, but you then think about the circumstances under which that happened. And yeah, perhaps it is no surprise, given that after that point, just about everything that happened to Bioware was a disaster, or in the case of Dragon Age Inquisition, a near miss to a disaster. So yeah, somehow I don't think they'll be ringing up EA to ask if they can license Frostbite. Ooh. Nice, simple, <laughs> Unreal Engine game where they all know the tech and it's all just nice and easy to work with. Oh, anyway, I guess we you know, wish him luck, good games in the future, and, I mean, broadly speaking, that's maybe the theme. You know, these big publishers, these big studios, they lose people, they then make these indie companies, and maybe these indies end up doing way better in a few years. Yeah, certain, certainly better than leaving to join to form a new company or following someone to join a new one that's just, like, started under stronger leadership. Certainly better than what Jason Schreier says, you know, what he's seen, which is so many people going, um, no, I'm actually done with games, thanks. So at least, at least they're hanging around. Then really, this next story is just such a natural segue. Um, right, so here is the, the headline. Ubisoft at high risk of losing talent following abuse allegations. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I'll, I'll go through the, our, our quick TLDR of this. So Ubisoft's annual universal registration document identified a moderate risk of quote, inappropriate behavior by employees and a high risk of failing to attract and retain talent, which seems like a big problem. Uh, Ubisoft worry that these risks will affect uh, talent retention, damage reputations, impact engagement, and reduce profits. Uh, they believe they've tried to fix it, but they can't guarantee the behavior will stop happening. Uh, measures are including mandatory training and uh, tying senior pay to culture improvement and the company has shifted up internal reporting to make things seem a lot more positive and proactive. So, look, 
we, we all know what was going on there, right? There was, I mean, you got your man, Serge, who was going around <laughs> ruining games, it seemed, and just a whole cavalcade of bullshit happening at Ubisoft. So it is no surprise that even their own internal documents are saying, hey, that thing that was a really big problem, turns out even though we may try to stop it, it might continue to be a problem because, you know, it's almost as if it's some sort of long cultural issue that you can't just flip a switch and turn off. That's the story, really, and yeah, this will be bad for Ubisoft. It probably should be bad for Ubisoft. It's probably okay if people go elsewhere and do other companies, like with what we just covered with Casey Hudson and what we've covered with Dreamhaven and the like. Yeah, there's like there's risks of losing talent for any number of reasons. It can be literally how you treat workers, or it can just be you're not a very nice place to work because of how people in the actual company act. And I think this is certainly... Uh, Oh, man. It's a thing where you, you can't really fix it immediately without doing massive damage to yourself. Because, like, I was reading, like, because they say they believe they've tried to fix it but can't guarantee the behavior. So you can guarantee the behavior w is no longer tolerated. You can guarantee from the top down, like, listen, all reports go at least up this high. We'll review them. Someone steps out of line. Gone. But then, you know, if the culture is so bad, then how many people are you going to lose from doing that? How yeah. many? How many of your like most talented devs, people who are core to your franchises and how your engine, like engines work and your tools work? How many of those have you trained or you know allowed to be, uh, you know problems for other staff, so they kind of have to choose a slow fix, and suffer with like struggling to gain talent, or they just remove all of the bad parts, tear out all the roots, and you know struggle for years. Yeah. And I've, well, a funny pickup or a good one by um, by uh, Megan and Stephen is, uh, yeah, much of their their new document is a copy paste job from last year's, um, but then that means that the additions and subtractions are the interesting thing. And you know there are things there like noting that they've hired a VP of Global Diversity and Inclusion and a Chief Persons Officer, um, and uh, you know stuff about their board, but also that they removed language from the prior year's document about how its unique employer culture helps ensure that uh, that the teams uh, you know remain in place and are loyal. So it's it's just yeah, it's quite funny. That's mainly that. Look, you know, you, you mess up and then you'll have a long-term problem to solve. And then I guess in terms of problems to solve, our next story is uh, an odd little one. So Titanfall has been um, under a little bit of fire. So uh, yes, Apex Legends and Titanfall have been targeted by hackers in order to raise awareness for the uh, basically the current state of Titanfall on PC. Um, and what's kind of funny here... Um, <laughs> There's only one to two people left at Respawn who are working on Titanfall. The rest are on Apex Legends, it seems. Um, at least, you know, from that that team, because there's obviously people working in other games. Um, and this was revealed by their community coordinator. And that's, um, yeah, that's, that's basically that. Turns out the reason why things are not ideal for Titanfall 2 and PC is they've only got one or two people working on its security issues. So, yeah. That like that that sounds that sounds awful, right? It sounds really bad to hear. Oh, you only got one or two people working, but it seems like the growth that happened at Respawn over the head of Apex has been so explosive that it seems they probably needed to get everyone from that Titanfall team to actually run core stuff for Apex. And it's so much more important to them than Titanfall 2 that hopefully they can get problems worked through. But it's clear that like, you know, everyone at Respawn who worked on Titanfall's on Apex, or even I imagine some of them maybe went with Vince to uh, Dice LA or Ripple oh, Effect, yeah. as they're uh, going to be called. So I, it it's really sad that you know <laughs> they can't solve this immediately because the the incentives aren't there. But I mean, it's yeah, and it really is because Titanfall Two had such a resurgence in PC after Apex Legends, and it's such a different game to Apex, and it's great. It yeah, it's it's a pity that. Well, I guess it's that thing. They don't really have much of a financial incentive. So the opportunity cost of putting people onto that is just, you know, goodwill and happy gamers, which, you know, that's good. But if you're not making the, if you're not making the money, then why are you going to put staff that you're paying for onto it? That's probably some of the thinking. Yeah, Plus, yeah. also, if Apex has, like, literally got fires that need to be put out, I mean, putting a bunch of engineers onto its tech issues is obviously going to be a, you know... <laughs> just a bad proposition really yeah i mean it's it, it like the fact that both games have been targeted for the same like raising awareness for titanfall it is very much you know you're fighting two concurrent battles 
Which one's more important? Yeah. It's not the it's not the case that Titanfall's there being destroyed. Apex is fine. And they're like, you know, just said, ah, just let Titanfall rot. It doesn't matter. Sure, we're still selling it, but we don't care. It's literally not that. Or at least it doesn't seem to be that. It is just, we can't do both of these at once. We're sorry about this. Yeah, seems like a bandwidth problem. Yeah. That said, they really should fix oh. that up because the Titanfall yeah. brand is important. And I really think there should be a Titanfall 3 in the future. Now that that brand, you know, kind of exists in people's minds again. I think it would just make sense. But maybe because 1 and 2 didn't really have, uh, you know, have that long distance performance, they're just not willing to. I mean, there you go. Get Ripple Effect to make, uh, a, you know, a Titanfall 3. Maybe not Ripple Effect, but, you know, get a Titanfall 3, but it's not called Titanfall 3. It's called, you know, Apex Legends, Titanfall 3 or something. <laughs> to kind of pull those people over to be ostensibly a, like, single player DLC for Apex Legends or something like that. Maybe get, a, maybe, maybe make people happy that way. Any maybe. way to get a a titanfall release that equals new content yep i think definitely definitely we've got some quick stories to go through so microsoft are they still planning to drop xbox live gold and there's a whole big report here but to just give you the the quick version of things uh jeff grubb has said that microsoft are planning to drop xbox live gold as like a you know, separate paid product um that you know, essentially all of its features will just be a free and included thing but if they're only going to do that once game pass is at a really big milestone, Jeff suggests 40 or 50 million people. So might take a few years, but I'd say certainly with Halo being in Game Pass, with Starfield being in Game Pass, with them probably announcing that the next Elder Scrolls will be on Game Pass day one, I imagine they will hit that goal. So overall, good. I don't really think it's, you know, ideal for customers. You're just paying to be able to do multiplayer. Um, yeah, there's not really much else to say other than this just tells us that Game Pass, Game Pass, Game Pass. That is the core of Microsoft's business model. And at least with Game Pass and that subscription, you're getting more money or <laughs> you're getting more game for your, you know, your, your buck. You're getting more value than you are from your uh, Xbox Live Gold money. So that's that. And imagine the win. Imagine the PR win when you go, uh, you don't need to pay for Xbox Live Gold to play multiplayer games online anymore. We're happy with Game Pass. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be a big loss for Sony, actually, because you do need pay, uh, PS Plus for those things. And that's quite funny because back in the day, it was the literal opposite situation where you needed Xbox Live Gold to play multiplayer, but you didn't have that in Sony. So a bunch of people, I mean, if you're just trying to sell what console you're going to get to your parents, you be like, this one needs a subscription, this one doesn't. But, you know, it's going to be reversed. And that just means we're seeing more and more of Microsoft's big plan where Microsoft are fighting on value whereas Sony are fighting on feeling ultra-premium and blockbustery. And we're just sort of seeing that play out in their business model. The next disappointment. Yes, disappointment, because what we all wanted in a new version of a Switch was, you know, something that was uh, good from a performance perspective, you know, maybe support like a DLSS or something like that. Just really anything to allow people to have performance on a Nintendo Switch that actually feels good docked. Now, fairness to nintendo their first party games are ludicrously well optimized but obviously it does hurt the the viability of the switch and you know as a sort of a multi-platform game thing when uh, you know a lot of accommodations need to be made for the switch well look this is a bit of an older story i'll do it quick the new switch basically oled more adjustable kickstand and a dock that is uh, available in white that um has got an ethernet port but the dock is sold separately oh and by the way the Joy-Cons are the same, so drift is still a problem. Overall, this is, I think, uh, and you know, it's it's OLED. OLED's way better, and also there's a smaller bezel, so the screen, I think it's from 6.2 to 7 inches. So all this stuff is really good. It's just, it's not really what people wanted, I think, for the core market. And it's 350 bucks, so, you know, it's not that. Yeah, look, I'd rather have a $450 uh, Nintendo Switch that actually runs games really well. That's that's my opinion. I think this is a bit of a loss from Nintendo, but maybe something that is, that is explainable by they probably have a bunch of, what's it, the Tagra X or whatever the, you know, the SOC they use. They probably just have the supply lines for those very short up, and I imagine in the current market, it's probably quite hard to get lots of new silicon to jam into something, and they probably wanted to do a Switch Pro. Almost certainly. I mean, this doesn't discount them from doing another hardware refresh that does come with better stuff, but it's kind of weird that this is literally, like, there's, I don't even think there's any better, like, battery life or anything like that. It is just, here's a Switch with an OLED screen. Enjoy? 
It's very strange as an upgrade. It's weird as an upgrade, but I think it might just be, you know, uh, it might be them trying to market this hardware refresh, this Switch version 1.2, like, because obviously the improved battery life one did come as like a 1.1 kind of, here's the new model. So they might just be kind of mar- trying to market it because there's a little bit of difference, but fundamentally it's not supposed to be all that new. I read something on Twitter that was s- someone who is deep into like emulation and I think like, uh, you know, basic- basically Switch hackers were talking about why the Switch doesn't have a new like SOC. And it's because there's stuff that's literally like tied to the Tegra X1 in terms of how games actually run. Wow. And I like I didn't do any super deep reading into that, but I kind of took them at their word for it when they said it. But I was like, that would be really interesting if they've literally like, you know, in some part of their architecture for the Tegra and for their games, they've actually stopped themselves from being able to make incremental improvements. You I'll, know, unlike every run other that console. Attack lead because he's ported. Um, oh, I mean he's. <laughs> not to mm. not to announce any platform things, but he is working on ensuring that you know our game one can be on Switch, um, and he's ported Switch games before, so I'll I'll have to double check and see what he knows. Mm. Interesting, um, a pity. Not what I yeah, sort of want more. Extremely Nintendo move. Why is why are we all surprised? We were surprised every time. But it's still a Nintendo move. Yeah. Like, of course it is. I'm waiting to walk into a store and just see Switch, LCD, Switch, OLED. And then for, you know, the average consumer to be expected to understand display technologies. Yeah, I mean, just call it the Switch Vivid. Call it the Switch Vibrant. Call it something. Just anything, please. The Nintendo Switch. Deep Blacks. <laughs> Then finally, two super quick things to round us off for id Software, because number one, they've apparently got a new project due in 2021 that's not Doom. It's rated in Australia, a project 2021B, published by Zenimax, developed by id Software. So there's, there's a filing there. We literally have no idea what that could be. And uh, then also some decent news there where id are actually helping with uh, the development of Redfall, because of course, Arcane, uh, you know, they do make great games. They do make great games that have shooting mechanics, but they're not really a shooter studio in the way that it are. So nice to see it are helping out, basically. Don't know if there's too much else to say. It equals good shit. Good shit equals me happy. That's my analysis in this one. Yeah, I think the only other analysis is a, a, a terrible joke, which, you know, Project 2021B not, doesn't exactly roll off the tongue as a game name. But I guess it means we'll likely see that at QuakeCon, because QuakeCon's usually late July, August, right, isn't it? Nice pickup. So you'll have QuakeCon. I mean, I guess that's why that's why our doc has the Quake thing. It's likely, you know, here's a Quake. Is it Quake Champions 2? I, probably not, because, you know, Microsoft will probably have... They wouldn't have been involved at the start of this project, but they'll probably have ideas for what to do with, like, a new Quake or something like that, which could be cool. And then on them helping with Redfall, sweet. Yep. Because... I actually think that game's probably going to be quite interesting, especially looking at uh, like Deathloop. Mm. If they, if it have helped at all on Deathloop in terms of shooting mechanics, or if you know, like if Redfall looks to feel as good as Deathloop looks, then you know the Doom people on a shooter. Yes, please. Yeah, good free. Fun. Yeah, so there free. we go. Mm-hmm. All right then. So that's it. Uh, you know, round up episodes. Sometimes there's just a whole bunch of stories. It don't make sense to do his own video, so uh, we sit down and uh, do a big catch-up of everything. And with this, I hope you're caught up. So, thank you, uh, thank you for watching. Let us know what you think about today's stories, and uh, we'll see you next time.